powerful speakers that I know are going to bless you real good. Well, our first speaker is the founder of Exodus Faith Ministries, which is a non-denominational Christian church in Virginia with a satellite in Boston, Massachusetts. In 2009, he launched STAND, which stands for Staying True to America's National Destiny, a national organization dedicated to restoring America's founding values, which were, uh, which were informed by the principles found within the Jewish and Christian faiths. He is the founder also of Youth with a Destiny, a nonprofit organization established to help youth avoid gangs, drugs, and violence. Most recently, he launched Exodus Now. The Exodus Project is a, is a national effort to encourage Christians and other people of moral values within the black community to leave the current Democratic Party because its current leadership has abandoned the founding principles of this nation. His articles have been published nationally and internationally. For 10 years, he did national commentaries carried on over 400 radio stations. He is a much sought after speaker and commentator of all the national media outlets. And in his spare time, he also served as the chaplain for the Boston Red Sox. Uh, I did ask him, were you there during those championship years? He said, I was there before that, so I was responsible for sowing the seeds for two World Series championships. Well, he's now running for Lieutenant Governor for the state of Virginia. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome Bishop E.W. Jackson. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I want to thank the Values Voters Summit for the opportunity to come and address you. It truly is an honor to be doing this. I cannot tell you how humbled I am to be the nominee for the Republican Party to become the next Lieutenant Governor of Virginia. And with God's help on November 5th, Ken Cuccinelli, Mark Obenshain, and E.W. Jackson will be leading the Commonwealth of Virginia for the next four years. Now, when I first got the nomination, uh, I was immediately attacked by the mainstream media. The first thing they asked me was, uh, you made some comments with regard to life, with regard to Planned Parenthood, uh, with regard to your understanding of the definition of the family as a union between one man and one woman. What we want to know is, are you willing to retract, amend, withdraw any of the statements that you have made? Are you willing to apologize for anything that you said? Well, I want to go on record here. I didn't apologize then. I don't apologize now. And I will never apologize for standing up for the truth. And of course, you all know that some of this is a growing hostility against Christianity. A growing hostility against those of us who believe in the Bible as truth. Uh, and they want us to back off of that. They want us to put the Bible aside. They want us to divorce ourselves from our faith. But folks, I also do not apologize for being a Bible-believing Christian. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. I believe that there is one name given unto heaven among men whereby we must be saved, and that is the name of Jesus. Every eye will behold him, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He is my Savior. He is my Lord. He is the King of kings. And I want to encourage you to keep standing up for that because if we allow that to be lost, we lose our country. Folks, what they don't understand is that those of us who believe in the Judeo-Christian value and tradition and ethic, we want others to be free to follow their conscience. We might try to persuade them individually, 
But we will stand between them and the government dictating to them what they should and should not believe. We are the ones who stand up for religious freedom for all people. And if we lose our Judeo-Christian traditions and values, then we have lost that freedom and it is under vicious attack. That is one of the reasons why I categorically, unequivocally, and without any apology whatsoever, oppose the Affordable Care Act known as Obamacare. It is a violation of the conscience of people who seek to follow their faith rather than the dictates of the federal government. <laughs> Folks, and that is why this election in Virginia in every election around the country right now is ultimately about one thing, freedom. Freedom, folks. Freedom, this is the stuff that beats in our hearts, that runs in our spiritual and intellectual DNA. Freedom. It's freedom that built the greatest nation on earth. The ability to live and, 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 and seek your own destiny, fulfill your own God-given potential, the ability to, to try and fail and try again, to innovate and experiment. And that freedom is what is under desperate attack right now. Uh, we are being told that the federal government knows better than we do how we should live. And the federal government knows better than we do what we should do with our private property. And the federal government knows better than we do how to run our families. And the federal government will take care of us. And the federal government will be our leader and our guide. But our founding fathers had a different idea. They gave us a constitutional republic based on the idea of a federal government with limited and enumerated powers that the sovereignty of this government is not in Washington, it is in we the people. And we have to reassert that again. We have to remind our fellow countrymen that that is what is at stake. No, it's not that we're going to wake up tomorrow morning and live in a, a totalitarian country. But as we surrender freedom bit by bit, inch by inch, we eventually find ourselves back into a corner from which there is no escape. And we have got to be sure that we always remind ourselves how fragile freedom is and that it requires eternal vigilance and that we've got to remind our government both at the federal and state level that the first three words of our constitution are not we the politicians, we the pundits, we the prognosticators, but we the people. We're the ones who are supposed to be answered to. We don't work for them. They work for us. That's the message that we have to get across. And folks, I'm a product of all that this nation represents. I'm a great-grandson of slaves and sharecroppers, Gabriel and Eliza Jackson from Orange County, Virginia. They could not have known that their great-grandson would be a candidate for lieutenant governor of Virginia. But God knew. God knew. God knew, because when, as Dr. King said, the Founding Fathers wrote the Declaration of Independence, they were writing a check to which every American would fall heir. A check when cashed would provide us the riches of freedom and the security of justice. I was raised in a foster home by poor people, Willie and Rebecca Molette. They lived in a little shotgun house that had no indoor bathroom. I ate mayonnaise sandwiches for dinner, sometimes biscuits and syrup, and yes, sometimes no dinner at all. Uh, we had a pot that went upstairs every night. And as the youngest of the foster children, I bought that pot down every morning. We took one Saturday night bath in a galvanized tub to get ready for church the next day. I was the last child to get in that tub. You can imagine what that tub looked like. But folks, even then I had hope. I had, I had the possibility that freedom showed me. I used to think to myself, and I remember this. I'm not making this up. I remember it, thinking, well, but maybe one day I can live in a nice house like that. Maybe one day I'll drive a nice car. Maybe one day I'll wear nicer clothes. Maybe one day I'll eat whatever I want to eat. 
because I saw it all around me. I knew it was there, uh, but unfortunately, my parents were not there. They had broken up. That's why I was in foster care. I became a juvenile delinquent, a ne'er-do-well, failed fifth grade, uh, committing petty crimes at a very early age. And folks, let me just tell you as a footnote, uh, we're working right now on doing some things to save our young people all across this country who are dying by the thousands at their own hands. And let me tell you something, folks. The answer is not a new government program. The answer is not midnight basketball. The answer is not let's spend some more money. The answer is to rebuild the family and put mothers and fathers in the home taking care of those children. That's the answer. My father came back into my life almost miraculously at the age of nine and a half. I can remember the moment because I was out in the streets when he found me, summoned me to his car, told me to get in the car, took me to the foster home and told them I'm taking my son with me. They, they became hysterical about it. He said, well, look, you do whatever you need to do. Uh, we'll talk about it in the course of wherever we need to talk about it, but my son needs me. Took me home to live with him. I remember the day he sat me down. He said, now, son, you're with me now. He said, and I expect two things of you. He said, I expect you to obey me in all things. He said, and I expect you to study hard. Education is the key to your future. He said, and if you do these things every day with me will be like a day of heaven on earth. He said, and if you fail to do these things every day, I will tear your behind all to pieces. <laughs> and by the way, it was legal then. Uh, so if you picked up the phone to call somebody, you just got it worse. Well, you know, I failed fifth grade. I really had. I remember the conference in which they were talking about keeping me back. But I found out I wasn't stupid because heaven on earth versus behind torn all the pieces. I said, heaven on earth sounds pretty good. I went from being an F student in fifth grade to being a straight A student in sixth grade. Went on to graduate summa cum laude from the University of Massachusetts Phi Beta Kappa and then on to Harvard Law School and Harvard Divinity School. Now, I forewarn you that the press has said they can find no record of me having gone to Harvard Divinity School because I was a cross-registered student from the law school. Uh, but I did go. I didn't finish Harvard Divinity School because I found out that it wasn't very divine. So, but folks, I, I don't say any of that to brag on myself, but to brag on my dad, first of all, my beloved father, and to brag on my country because that's what America does. That's what we produce. And that's what we've got to make sure the next generation understands, that we can look them in the eye and say, your life can be better than your parents. You can have opportunities that they never had. My father had a sixth grade education, worked 33 years in Sunship Building and Dry Dock Company as a third class welder with one dream, that his son could have a better life than he had. In fact, that's another thing he told me. He used to say, son, this is the United States of America, the greatest nation on earth. You can do anything and be anything your gifts and talents can allow you to be, but I expect you to go out there and do it. He used to say, nobody owes you anything. You don't have a right to demand that anybody give you anything. You earn your way. You reach for the stars. He said, and you may not land on the stars, but I can guarantee you this, if you never reach, you'll never get anywhere. That's the way I was taught, folks. Can you imagine what it was like for him to watch me get a degree from Harvard Law School? But that's the promise of our country. That's who we are. And we cannot substitute hard work and commitment and dedication for dependence and handouts and government control. You know, we care about people. We care about the black community and, and the poverty that exists in the inner city. We care about those single mothers who are caught up in the intergenerational poverty that welfare provides. We care about those Hispanic families. We care about those people out there. But the difference is we don't want them dependent upon us or anybody else. We want them to soar to the heights to which their gifts and talents will take them. And freedom produces that. 
Ronald Reagan said freedom is never more than one generation from extinction. We do not pass it on to our children in the bloodstream. It must be fought for and protected and passed on to them to do the same. Or we will spend our sunset years telling our children and our children's children about the United States of America where once men were free. That cannot be our legacy. We cannot allow that to happen. Someone asked me once, well, what if it's already happened and we just don't know it? This is my answer. I hope it's yours. That if out of 315 million Americans, if I have to be the last and only one standing up for that flag, the last and only one standing up for our freedom, standing up for our Constitution, if I have to be the last one standing up for the Judeo-Christian values upon which this nation was built, I will do it until I breathe my dying breath. But I will never give up. I will never give in. I will never back down. I'll give my life for this country, but I'll never turn it over to the likes of those who now occupy the federal government. And if we will all take this attitude, we will not only win elections, we will win the hearts and minds of our fellow countrymen, and we will restore this country to its foundational principles. Folks, Virginia is where the foundations of this nation were laid, and Virginia is where they must be restored. I mean, look, I don't mean to brag on Virginia, but I find it an interesting historical fact that Virginia gave us George Washington, that Virginia gave us Patrick Henry, give me liberty or give me death. That Virginia gave us Thomas Jefferson. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Virginia gave us James Madison and our Constitution. Virginia gave us George Mason and our Bill of Rights. Folks, Virginia has played an historic role in the formation of this nation. And I believe that in 2013, Virginia can turn up the light of liberty so that Americans can see it from sea to shining sea and once again remi be reminded that we are indeed a constitutional republic and the greatest nation the world has ever known. That's what we're fighting for. That's why I'm running. And for that reason only, not for a title, not for sinecure, but because I love this country. I believe in it. It's been the greatest blessing given to mankind other than Jesus himself. More freedom, more opportunity, more possibility for more people, a higher standard of living than the world has ever known. A 5,000 year leap, if you will. And we must preserve the great blessing that we have been given. And it is up to us, these the citizens of the United States of America, to make sure that we do not lose the great gift that has been bequeathed us. So no, we cannot give up our freedom. We cannot surrender it to those who I believe are trying to take it away. Because my vision for America is captured in my favorite patriotic hymn, My country tis of thee, sweet land of liberty of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride, from every mountainside, let freedom ring. I believe that, that that's who we are, and we must fight to defend it. And the last verse is my favorite, because it's a prayer. And I'm not ashamed of prayer. I don't understand how we've come to a place where there are people who have dedicated their lives to stopping prayer everywhere they find it. But they'll never be able to stop us from praying. We are a praying people. And the last verse captures that George Washington himself was a praying man. I've got a portrait of him during Valley Forge on his knees in the snow head bowed in humble supplication before God, hat on one side, sword on the other. That's who we are, folks, and we can never deny that. We're not trying to impose anything on anybody, just trying to be true and authentic to who we are as Americans. And that last verse captures that. Our Father's God to thee, author of liberty, to thee we sing, 
Long may our land be bright with freedom's holy light. Protect us by thy might, great God our King. My friends, if we will turn up the light of liberty so brightly that Americans will see it all over this nation, we will remind our fellow countrymen that we are indeed and still a shining city on a hill, that we are indeed the last best hope on earth, that we are indeed the land of the free and the home of the brave, and we can make the 21st century, instead of a century in which we slide into authoritarianism and totalitarianism, we can make it the century of a rebirth of freedom in which we experience more freedom, more opportunity, more possibility than we ever have before. That's our vision for where our country is going. Not into the darkness, but more into the light than we've ever been before. A greater nation than we've ever been before. More shining city on a hill than we've ever been before. That is my hope. That is my vision. Fight with me to make it happen. Stand up to make it happen. God bless you. God bless you. And God bless the United States of America. Thank you.